What's not to watch? They're the best at what they do, and I'm the best at what I do, and together it's like, it's on. You're the best? Best there ever was. Best there is now, best there ever will be. And then when I walked down the street, people would have looked, and they would have said, there goes Roy Hobbs. The best there ever was in this game. In case some of you wonder who the best is, they're up here on this plaque on the wall. You sure you're ready for this? I'll do my best. Your best? Losers always whine about their best. Winners go home and f the prom queen. We are live on the air, the best soccer show, Jason Davis and Jared Dubois. Ha ha ha. What's up, party people? Wednesday night, live edition. North American Soccer Network, NASN.TV. This is your call-in edition. This is your email edition. This is your voicemail edition. Well, we do voicemails, both shows, but especially on Wednesdays. Uh, there is plenty to talk about uh, this week, uh, midweek. We've got Grant Wall in the second segment. That's a, uh, a big deal. Love talking to Grant Wall about anything, but especially about uh, U.S. Men's National Team, MLS topics. Um, some Beckham-related questions, perhaps, Jared. I mean... <laughs> There is, uh, there's a lot of... When th- isn't there Beckham questions if Grant Wall's involved? That's I, exactly right. He's got to be right. tired at this point. I'm sure he is, but I know he'll be a good sport and he'll answer those questions. Uh, we are taking calls, uh, if you can hear us, and who knows if you can, but we're going to work those things out, right? 201-430-BEST, 201-430-2378 is the phone number, provided that we're live. Uh, we've got conference finals to talk about. We didn't get a chance to do that yet. Uh, so I don't know. Do you want to start there? Do you want to start with impressions from Sunday, the the double header? We have a final, like you said, double header on Sunday, and I, for my money, it's kind of anticlimactic. Um, the, because what RSL and, and LA didn't quite live up to the billing. Because I feel like I watched the best final the season could have given me already. With uh, the RSL LA final, I mean that was a good game, but it was by no means overly dramatic. I mean. I don't know how to be over dramatic, but I think it was a well played, entertaining game, wide open, which I doubt your the final is going to give you. How, how often do you ever watch any yeah. type of final of anything and it's wide open well, like that game was? That's the that's the I think the problem and why people were not concerned. But if you were neutral and you're watching those two games and you see uh, Houston and, and Sporting Kansas City on one side and LA and RSL on the other, what you're hoping to see as a complete and utter neutral. What you're hoping to see is RSL and Sporting, because those are the two teams that are going to give you the best, perhaps most entertaining matchup in the final. You would think. I mean, things no, can what change. What I wanted to see was RS, I mean, LA and RSL, or LA and Seattle, RSL and Seattle. I wanted to see two of those top three teams in the final, but MLS can't figure out a way to give me that. <laughs> well, I mean, this is the way things shook out. You can make, you can, we can complain about the the playoff structure the again. Is, it, it, there wasn't even a chance of it. That's what bothers me. There wasn't even a chance of it. Okay, okay. No, I mean, I, I understand you. Am I, I, am I just crying in my milk right now? There's nothing we can do about it. Everyone understands what the. No, I I I think you have a point about uh, about the 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 better teams having to play off against each other and that eliminating. You know, Seattle and RSL had to face off against each other. Seattle doesn't get a chance to, you know, go. On. Basically, what you're advocating is what we've talked about for the last couple of weeks, and it's the straight seeding situation. Forget the conferences once you get to the playoffs. Have the best team play the worst team. Two play nine, three plays, or however you want to do it. If you want to have that wild card round, it would be one play the lowest wild card, two play the next lowest wild card. None of this Seattle having to face RSL in a conference quarter final or semifinal, whatever that was, and that way you don't have this issue of. Uh, you know, two teams that earned their way into those seeds being having to, to knock one another out. I mean, that's it's just it is a pain. Well, what do you what do you make of the uh, of the L.A. bot their MLS Cup uh, type of I, I've seen that theme out there a bit. Well, how they can still you had to win the games? Right. No, sure. They did. They sure had to. They still had to win the games. And I actually I'm of the opinion that that what L.A. did in terms of spending was less, I mean, it definitely was, let's go win an MLS Cup with Beckham and, and Donovan and Keane and, and, and these guys. But it's also, it's also L.A. and it's, it's AEG's flagship and it's, it's about the glitz and the glamour and the, getting the notoriety. That, that, half of that, half of signing 
Beckham in 07, well, most of signing Beckham in 07, but half of signing Keane this year is is getting, you know, getting their name out there. They're the most they got to be the most popular team in the British Isles right now, well, you would imagine. Um, yeah. <laughs> the most popular, popular I, MLS I, team. I, we're, we're, we're huge in uh, in Wales or something. I, 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 <laughs> no, no, not Wales. England and Ireland. <laughs> I, well, I mean, so they're all the same to me. I understand England and Ireland where those guys are from, but you You're said the killing British me. Isles. The... Yeah, no, no. I, I, when I said the British Isles, I meant the island of Br- Great Britain, which England is the major part, and the island of Ireland, of which Ireland is the major part. You got I one know, guy. The thing is that I, it doesn't really bother. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't make any sense to me to be big in in the British Isles no, if I, you don't win an MLS I, Cup. I, I agree and with you. And that's what I've been dealing with as a person from LA for the last four or five years. <laughs> I, no, as a Galaxy fan, I completely understand where you're coming from. But what, I, what I'm saying is, you know that it wasn't necessary for AEG to go and find those guys, those big name players to go win a cup. It, it wasn't absolutely necessary. Because look what Houston's done on the other side. Who does Houston have that anybody outside of MLS or North America would recognize? Anybody? None? None? Not one. Not really. Not one. You're not going to... Like, Carlos If Carlos Coastley is your big name foreign signing, it tells you something about what they did. If your big name, Carl, if your big name signing is rocking a Jerry Curl from 1982, <laughs> you, you, your, your chances are lost. At least he cut it. Right. At least he cut right. it. No, no, what no. if he hadn't cut it? <laughs> well, but my, my point is that Houston, and this is the thing, this is the other angle to all this, right, is the AEG versus AEG angle. You've got the, the big flashy uh, LA Galaxy owned by AEG and the less flashy, completely unflashy, Workman like blue collar Houston Dynamo, both with their, you know, appealing aspects, both with, you know, Houston's got the great coach. I mean, not that L.A. doesn't, but, you know, the the, the storyline is that that uh, Dominic Kinnear has done a magnificent job with this Houston team, getting them to an MLS Cup final when nobody thought they could get there. They had to go into the the cauldron up there in Kansas City and get it done without Brad Davis. Who goes down and now has? Now, hit- I think that's a storyline. I the Dominic Kinnear stuff. I mean, that, I, I whatever. I've I've heard it before. I've heard it <laughs> numerous times, numerous times over the last couple of years. But losing Brad Davis, right. your possible MVP, and the, the, the way that Houston rebounded from that. As soon as Davis went out, I was like, this is a KC's game because they're playing that's in, what I uh, in Kansas City. That's what I thought. You lose you lose the most effective player on your team without a doubt. And Houston chooses to rally behind it rather than let it get him down, and that yeah. is inspiring. It, 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 you have to give full credit to Houston. I think that I mean, okay, I, I hate to do this, and, and maybe this isn't the appropriate forum for for a, for one of our games. But would you say that Houston won that game by virtue of rallying around the fact that Brad Davis was gone? Or did Sporting Kansas City lose that game? Because it was definitely there for, for Kansas City's uh, taking, and they just didn't they didn't figure it out. They couldn't get it done. Now, I'm going to you know, go with Houston. Houston won that game. Okay. I, okay. It was too easy for – not too easy. I mean, nothing is easy. But – to to it's not like they made it to play to overtime and, and won in a shootout it's not like they clung on for dear life once brad davis got out they won 2-0 right. away in one of the best stadium environments in the country which has to be imposing by all accounts so i, I will say, say that houston won that game Houston and, and seattle in turn i see seattle excuse me sporting kansas city in turn Lost it. They laid an egg. <laughs> you just sat on the way? fence. No, you just sat on the fence. I, I'm asking you if you okay. If you had to pick one, gun to your head, Houston went out and won it. Kansas Houston City won. lost it. Houston, Houston won. won it. Okay, but I, I'm, I, that, I'm fine with didn't that. Didn't just lose. They 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 shot the bed. <laughs> Are you allowed to say that on this show? Are we going to have to put it's an ex- past tense? So I think it's okay. <laughs> We're going to have to put an explicit tag on this now. Uh, no, I, uh, I I tend to agree with you. Jeff Cameron. Jeff Cameron was immense. There, you know, guys for Houston just stepped up. And, and for the first time ever, I am willing to listen to the people now say that Jeff Cameron needs a shot at the national team level. Okay, Jeff Cameron over Omar Gonzalez. What? 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 What I'm just saying. Uh, personal preference. I, I think Jeff Cameron is definitely a like Tim Ream. I still think Omar Gonzalez is way down there in terms of ball control and right. uh, and handling and passing. Jeff Cameron as a central midfielder as well. I mean, the guy's played pretty much everywhere over the, on the field. Right. You know Houston he can handle last couple years. You know he can he handle himself. He absolutely will be a better passer and better controller of the ball than Omar Gonzalez. Well, I mean, will. But I, Omar Gonzalez is still the better pure defensive center match. Okay, but back. that's that's I think, and I don't want to transition all the way into U.S. men's national team topics. But if we're gonna go there 
Jeff we're Ka- not because these are the two teams playing in the MS Cup well, finals. Okay, but, I think we still can do it. Right, right, right. They're facing off against each other. It'll be a good battle of young center backs, guys who should, probably should get a look, and, and Klinsman's going to have to keep an eye out. But uh, if you're going for the idea that you can't – you Omar Gonzalez is uh, is not the right type of center back to match up with, I don't know, Aguchi Anyewu or, or Carlos Bocanegra or whoever you're going to put in the middle there, Clarence Goodson – uh, that because he is a little, because he's slower, because he's his ball handling is not his his ball skills are not that refined. Because he is kind of the big he, he in he's in the the mold of a Gucci Anyewu. I mean, he's a very good defender and he is massive in the air, but that doesn't necessarily translate to what Klinsman wants to do on the national team. If that's your attitude, then maybe Jeff Cameron is the best of both worlds. And I'm sure I'll, there I'll are people... I'll put it down right now. I'll put it down right now. In, outside of Camp Cupcake, which we don't know how Clemson's going to handle that yet. I no, mean, he no may idea. handle it Bradley. He may handle it completely differently. I think it's funny, outside though. outside of that camp, yeah. outside of that camp, I will go on the record saying Jeff Cameron gets a call up before Omar Gonzalez does. Okay. All right. We, we'll lock that in for you. He I, fits I mean, what Klinsman wants more. And by all, everything Klinsman showed us before, is so far, Jeff Cameron fits more. Okay, so why isn't he in there now? Ah, I, I think maybe he's kind of made a, a case late. Tim Ream is, I mean, Clemson's been in love with Tim Ream. He's right. the only center back in MLS that he's even bothered calling well, up. Until the Tim Ream love affair is over, I don't know if there's room in this camp for more than one MLS center back. Okay. No, I, that, that, that may be true. Now, now in, in you've got two weeks. I mean, we're a week and a half away now, but we had two weeks from conference finals to, to the final in, uh, in L.A., uh, talk a little bit about being there, what you've heard about ticket sales, because I think that's a little bit of a story. I mean, look, it's in L.A. It's the Galaxy or have a chance to win a title at home. That's why tickets are going as fast as they are. But it's still good to see, exciting to see that there are tickets going. I mean, I looked up, there were a pair of tickets, center uh, you know, center line that were going for $1,000 for the pair or something like that. I mean, I kid you not, that's exactly where my seats are, and I'm giving them away <laughs> instead of selling them. I'm so bitter right now. That's craziness. What are you doing, and why are you doing it? <laughs> Good, goodwill towards men. Oh, okay. Well, I, I think I know who so, who those tickets are going to. So perhaps. Uh, well, one of them. Yeah, the, oh, the other wow. one I actually am gifting to a, a gifting to my brother for his birthday. So oh, that's of the year. so nice of you. Well, I mean, I, I, but so, I will so not buy him beer. There is going to be, and this is the thing about at, at least, if you want to grouse about LA and the style they play, going up against Houston and the style they play, and not having you know attractive RSL or dynamic Sporting Kansas City in this final, uh, at least you know that the the atmosphere will be vibrant, that there will be a full house. This isn't going to be Toronto 2010. It's a very cool thing, and I know everyone's out there with the conspiracy theories that uh, LA is hosting, so they had to make the final. But I'm excited to see <laughs> what a home MLS Cup final looks like. I'm, I like. I'm very excited to see it. I, I like the fact that you're just gonna go. Actually, ahead. I want to get Grant Wall's opinion on conspiracy theories in MLS uh, when we get sure. back. Oh, that's a, yeah. You're definitely gonna have to mark that down to to ask him. I think they're ridiculous. Especially not... when it comes to AEG in LA, no one probably has more insight on whether or not there's conspiracy theories in MLS than Grant Wall. Well, I don't know. Is he? Is he? You think he's on good terms with everybody over there at this point? Oh, if he's good terms or not, he definitely has the insight. <laughs> well, I, I I think those conspiracy theories are hilarious. Of course, MLS as a corporate, you know, as as at the in headquarters, money making entity. Of course, they want LA and New York to do everything. Of course, they do. Those are the biggest markets in the country. They get the most attention. Sponsors pay the most attention to those markets. But that doesn't mean they are. There are machinations in place to make sure these things happen. LA got to the final because they're a damn good team and they're very good at what they do. And they spent some money to get some quality. Now, like I said, I don't think they had to spend all of that money to get where they are. But it certainly greased the skids. I mean, it certainly helps to have to have you know Landon Donovan locked up and David Beckham and, and Robbie Keane and Janino in the midfield just destroying everything. I mean, p- playing his ass off. So there are a lot of things there that are at play. All right, let's take a break. It's the best soccer show live on a Wednesday uh, in North American Soccer Network, NASN TV. Grant Wall on the other side of this break. Don't go anywhere. It is one of those nights. Jason Davis, Jared Dubois, back on the Best Soccer Show live on a Wednesday evening. Uh, joined right now 
by Sports Illustrated's Grant Wall to talk, I'm assuming, everything American soccer. So we'll keep him around for as long as he wants to stick around. How are you, Grant? I'm good. How are you? Oh, we're flustered, but that's just standard operating procedure for us. Uh, <laughs> all right. So, you know, we, we talked MLS playoffs. We talked uh, our potential, or our, I'm sorry, our final, our set final uh, coming, up, coming up in a week and a half in our first segment. Your thoughts on, on the conference finals, first of all. Houston, you know, a little bit of a surprise. And then that L.A. RSL game, which I know. A little bit of a surprise? Who picked Houston? Come no, no, on. no. Okay, yes, you're right. It's, it's a fairly large surprise. But Sporting Kansas City didn't impress anybody for a, for a couple months to start Grant the Wall, did you, Grant Wall, did you have Houston pick to make the final? No, sir. I had Kansas City winning that game. <laughs> All right. So let's start there. We'll move on to the bigger game uh, in a second. The, the Coming through without Brad Davis. I mean, that was the thing, the talking point that Jared and I had uh, when we, we talked about this game. A little bit of a surprise, a lot of a, a lot of surprise that Brad Davis went down with an injury and Houston still managed to pull it out. Yeah, honestly, when he went out, it really seemed to me like Houston was going to have a really slim chance of winning that game. Um, and for for them to get uh, the win and also to get it on a set piece coming uh, from from Moffitt uh, instead of Davis, uh, just really impressive. I mean, one of my questions, and I haven't had a chance to talk to anybody from Houston since the game, is, you know, how often does does Moffitt even take set pieces in training? Right. You know, I mean, here's right. a right footed guy you're used to as a receiver getting uh, left footed uh, dead balls from from Brad Davis. I would assume all season long. Right. And so how big of a change is that? I mean, it's um, Houston has really impressed me just the last month and a half, just with their ability to suddenly start winning games on the road after not winning one for so long. Um, and just, you know, very professional performance. And I thought Kansas city maybe was a little bit too emotional and maybe not relying on the skill that I know that they do have that we've seen earlier in the year. When it comes down to it, though, Houston is just a veteran team that's been here before. And you think you saw that the way they closed out that game. And Kansas City, a bunch of up-and-coming coming talent, great great guys, great team, uh, exciting team to watch. But exciting teams don't necessarily get results. And what you saw is Dom, Dom McKinnear with a well-coached team of veterans lo locked down that game. And what Jason and I were talking about before you got on, he posed a question to me, and we'll pass it on to you, Grant. Did Houston win this game or did Kansas City just lose it? I think there were some elements of both, uh, to be honest. Uh, I, I just thought Kansas City was a little frazzled the whole way through. Maybe that had to do with their youth. Maybe it had to do with the way they were kind of playing the game. Um, you know, and they certainly had some chances. Uh, I, I do think, though, that when you look at Houston's back line right now and you see what uh, an impact Jeff Cameron has made since moving back to the central defense and how well he works with Bobby Boswell and – you know, Boswell's a former MLS Defender of the Year, and Cameron, I honestly think, when he plays center back, might be the best central defender in MLS. Uh, and when you have that going for you, I think you've got a chance in any game, which is something to remember for the final. You mentioned Jeff Cameron. We talked about him, of course, uh, kind of a man of the match performance for Houston. Without him, they don't uh, keep that clean sheet. They don't probably win that game. He is a guy that doesn't quite get as much U.S. Men's National Team chatter as, say, Omar Gonzalez does, who just won Defender of the Year admittedly, but maybe Jeff Cameron is a guy who is a little bit more uh, adept with the ball than, than Omar Gonzalez, somebody who might fit Jurgen Klinsmann's ideas of what he wants out of a center back more than Omar Gonzalez does, and uh, why hasn't he gotten a shot yet? You know, it's a great question. I, yeah, I honestly don't know at this point what Jurgen Klinsmann's issue is with MLS defenders. Um, you know, he's called in Ream. Um, so I guess that's something, um, uh, I think at one point he called in Heath Pierce early on, but didn't get a chance to play. Um, you know, it's, it's odd, uh, to be frank. Uh, and is it an indictment on MLS grant? Well, it is to some extent. It's also just a, a personal preference. I think of, uh, of Jurgen Klinsmann and his coaching staff, um, you know, I, I don't know what to say at this point, except that Michael Orozco Fiscal continues to have more pressure put on him from a, pu a public standpoint to show that he deserves to be in there. 
I don't think we are necessarily uh, <laughs> contributing to that in any positive positive <laughs> manner ourselves either. But uh, it's getting to the L.A. game and maybe with the L.A. and, and uh, Houston game together, everyone's talking about the AEG final, the AEG final, and with that – uh, come the conspiracy theorist <laughs> out of the woodwork. Uh, Grant, you as a person that has had some very good insight behind the curtain of AEG, is there any truth to this or is it as what Jason and I have kind of said is that if you want it to be true, you'll find a way to be, for it to be true? You know, I don't think there's any conspiracies going on here as far as Houston rolling over for L.A. I, I do think that when, when I talked to Tim Liewicki at AEG, and he's been good over the years to give me a fair amount of access, um, he talks about L.A. as their team, and he doesn't really talk about Houston in those terms. And I think part of it comes down to the simple fact that they have no desire to sell the Los Angeles Galaxy to anybody. And they are trying to sell their mm -hmm. portion of the Houston Dynamo to somebody. And one of the reasons they've stayed involved in Houston is because it's, you know, they've had a big role in that stadium getting done. Um, but, you know, when you walk into the AEG offices uh, in Los Angeles, like I did last month, you know, you're, not, you're seeing logos of the teams that they're involved with. Uh, the Dynamo is not one of them. The Galaxy is. <laughs> uh oh. So so all the, all those uh, giant chips on the shoulders down there in Texas, they're they're justified. These guys are they're getting short. They got them a stadium. From, what else from, do they no, have no, to no. do? No, no, no. But look, I mean, they they're succeeding. So maybe they're succeeding in spite of the ownership group. But they have a right to feel aggrieved a little bit, at least until the team is sold. I think so. And it, it, there's a couple of interesting things I'd share. I, I did mention this on Twitter the other day, which was during the All-Star game in Houston last year, I actually saw Phil Anschutz in the lobby of the main hotel before one of the meetings, and he was wearing a Los Angeles Galaxy t-shirt in Houston. So <laughs> that told me a fair amount. Right. Uh, you know, the other thing being that I find this matchup in the final fascinating in the sense that you're talking about really two different philosophies of how to build MLS teams. And the Galaxy is clearly in the designated player camp. They spent a lot of money on DPs over the years. Uh, and Houston represents these teams that have never or that have actually won MLS titles in recent years mm -hmm. uh, without getting a designated player since the rule went into effect. And it's two completely different philosophies. Um, you know, and, and it's fascinating to me that it's their teams owned by the same group. Well, also, what's also amazing is that two different it's owned by the same group operated completely differently with very similar successful results. Yeah, I think so. The, honestly, I mean, those successful results for L.A. have come in the last couple of years. They haven't come so much in the years before that. <laughs> um, you know, and even L.A.'s championship in 2005 being kind of like the ninth or tenth best team in the playoffs mm -hmm. that year. So, um, yeah, I, I think it's it, – to me, it's very interesting. And, you know, I know when, when I talked to Donovan last month out in L.A., he was like, we want to win this for Phil, Phil Anschutz. Um so as low a profile as Phil Anschutz keeps, and the guy hasn't done an interview in 35 or 40 years, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it'll be interesting to see how visible he is during MLS Cup weekend. Well, they put a lot of eggs in the in the Beckham basket, as you know, and have written about. And, uh, you know, the, the if, if they can manage to get this done against Houston, uh, you know, it's coming a long time after signing Beckham. And, and obviously they wanted to return on that investment much quicker than they're than they might get it. Uh, but does this, you know, is it some kind of uh, uh, ret retribution for for the experiment for Beckham himself and MLS? I mean, is there any of that going on here? I don't think so. You know, I, I just feel like there's a lot of pressure on LA to win this thing, and a lot of it's coming from the top of AEG, um, and they feel like they've spent a lot of money. Uh, the team has performed. Bruce Arena has done a very good job there, uh, and yet. My feeling is if they don't win this final on their home field, uh, they will look at this season as not being successful. Now, does a win or a loss in this game affect whether you think Beckham will be back next year? Is it a different outcome if Galaxy wins and a different outlook if uh, outcome if Galaxy loses? I mean, I'm, 
I have no certainty on this, but I would say that I think that the result of this final may have an impact on Beckham's decision. And I think if the Galaxy does win a major trophy for the first time since he arrived, um, there's at least maybe a slightly greater chance that he leaves. Um, you know, and, and I think uh, based on, I mean, I've read reports from France uh, saying this is a 95% done deal to PSG. They Honestly, printed, I they, don't really believe that very Grant, much. Grant, they printed up 20,000 jerseys with his name on it is the report I saw. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't totally buy it at this point. And, and I think everyone should realize that it's in David Beckham's interest that he play coy right now and say lots of nice things about PSG and everyone else because that helps him when he sits right. down at the negotiating table with the Galaxy. Uh, we even heard a rumor he might be on his way to Tijuana. I, yeah, I saw <laughs> that. I think that'd be great. I'd love that. Uh, all right, so you got a pick here, L.A., Houston on the 20th in L.A. with that crowd mostly behind L.A.? I feel good about L.A. winning the game. I think it's probably going to be – tougher than a lot of people might expect simply because of, of the back line for Houston mm -hmm. and the way they've played the last six weeks or so. Uh, I think Houston's going to make this game difficult for LA. Uh, and it's not like the home Depot center has some great home advantage. I know they haven't lost there this year, um, but it's not a snake pit by any means. And my guess is for a final like this, where you're going to have a lot of people, paying big money you're going to have more kind of first time fans there and it might feel like a super bowl type atmosphere um which you know is, is not going to make it like a, a fearful setting for the houston dynamo before we get out of mls cup and move on to other things if houston is going to have a chance in this game who has to step up for in brad davis's absence well moffitt needs to continue doing what he did in the last game um you know, I, I think this is a team is it, though? situation here. And uh, if they can get some set pieces on the edge of the box or a little bit beyond, um, you know, you've got guys like Boswell who can finish or Hano who we've seen score twice in the playoffs. Um, you know, I, I think Tally Hall's had a really good playoffs, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, I, I think it's interesting, too. I mean, a guy like Brian Ching has been in a lot of battles over the years. Um you know, he's a guy who could who could be big. Uh, and I've been impressed with Kalen Carr. I think it wasn't yeah. that long ago that people were starting to argue that maybe uh, the Carr for Oduro trade was actually maybe the most one-sided trade of the year, not the, the Di Rosario trade. Um, and I don't know if people are saying that as much right now after the playoffs that Carr's had. Right. I was well, speaking of uh, Kalen right. Carr, though, I mean, think of uh, Chicago let both Carr and Barrett go, and now both those strikers are going to be in the final. I mean, yeah. what does that say about Chicago? Well, they got a, they got a, they got it's a... pretty funny, isn't it? I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, it's um, I, I like the fact that there's a lot of kind of working class American players involved in this on both sides. Right. When you look at L.A. having you know Barrett, Mike McGee. Um, if you read my book, you know, I have a huge affinity for Alan Gordon. And, you know, those are Alan Gordon's. Right, right. All right. Let's move on to uh, U.S. men's national team topics. Got friendlies coming up. Let's. I guess we'll we'll focus on France. That's the first one. Uh, Landon Donovan is skipping this for MLS Cup, uh, tying these two things together. I think it's the right call. I don't know how anybody can really blame him for making this decision. Uh, what do you think this means for Klinsman, though, trying to continue to build his team and, and not having so much success so far? He needs his guys. Yeah, it's uh... – it is what it is, you know, I mean, and you got a sense reading between the lines of Klinsman's statement that he may not be all that happy that Donovan's not coming, but, um, you know, I, I, I'm totally cool with the fact that Donovan's not going to be playing in this game. And, uh, at the same time, I can sort of understand Klinsman's frustration a little bit that he hasn't had Donovan and Clint Dempsey on the field yet together. But, um, you know, I, I, I think in the big picture, Donovan is not a guy he needs to worry about very much. Uh, and this only becomes a real issue necessarily if, you know, the U.S. gets blown out of the water by France. Grant, what do we make from the fact that then and Donovan drops out of the team and Klinsman brings no one in to replace him when the entire uh, public, uh, just U.S. soccer viewing public, is clamoring for a certain offensive player to be included in this, and he's just going to go put his hand up and go, like, no, I'm good. Yeah, that's kind of a head-scratcher, to be honest. And 
um, you know, I look at it as I think Sasha Question should have been called in from the start and definitely should have been called in as a replacement. Right. Um, He's next you know, door. Don. He's right next door. It, 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 it's a quick, you know, it's a quick trip. Germany went through right. Belgium to even get to France. <laughs> Yeah, uh, it, it's it's totally confusing, and I, you know, it, it's something that makes you wonder about when you know how many of, of Sasha's games is Klinsman really watching? Right. I think Sasha asked that same question. Uh, he may have said so on Twitter, and then <laughs> subsequently deleted the tweet. Uh, <laughs> uh, all right, look, nobody's giving the U.S. any chance against France. Slovenia is a tough out as well. It's not like anybody thinks they're going to walk in there and and walk away with a win. And and the U.S. doesn't particularly perform well in Europe to begin with. So let's just assume losses. I hate to be that guy, but let's assume losses. Do those losses matter at all, or is it the nature of the losses? We're getting more nuanced here. Yeah, you know, I mean, like the games haven't happened yet, so I think we'll be in a better position to talk about afterward. But if the U.S. comes out of this with one win in Klinsman's seven games, um, you know, that's tough. Yeah, you know, <laughs> that's not a winning culture right there. And And I've been – kind of leading the charge and saying that, you know, results in these games don't matter, but you really do want to see improvement. And, um, you know, I guess that's possible. And I think maybe if uh, you're trying to find maybe a, a bit of a silver lining, it's that France's defenders have not played well in recent games and that mm -hmm. they're not going to have some of their best guys like Abidal or Evra in this game. Right. And, uh, in fact, they may actually try a few guys that haven't gotten a lot of caps and save. Uh, some of their best guys for the Belgium game a few days later. Grant, uh, talking about the Slovenia game, we had a question from uh, one of the voicemails that we had uh, left today on, uh, on, on our voicemail. Uh, <laughs> it was asking a question to Jason and I. We wanted to kind of push it on to you. Is Given the Slovenia matchup, which roster would you rather uh, – would you go for? The, the roster that was up against Slovenia in the World Cup or the one that's going to be facing them in the next week? You want to rephrase that again? I'm trying Just to follow that one. Which, if you had to pick one of the rosters uh, between 2010 World Cup against Slovenia and the roster Klinsman's called up to face Slovenia this time around, which one are you choosing? Um, you know, I mean, there's not that many differences, are there? I mean, Double. Um, you know, given that this is a U.S. team that's starting a four-year cycle still, you want to see some of these young guys in action. And so I'd want to see Breck Shea out there seeing – how he can play um right. you know I, so, uh, I i guess i look at it as some of the big lineup questions for the u.s heading into this for both games including slovenia are is michael bradley going to start right. um you know we haven't seen that in a while uh and who's going to play on the right is he is he really even thinking about putting robbie rogers back out there or fabian Martin johnson C fabian, fabian johnson. johnson or yeah. williams again uh, I, I think, you know, you can't divorce the circumstances from the teams. And, and obviously, one's a World Cup team, one's a, a friendly in the beginning of a cycle, like you said. So uh, so this is something that, that Jared brought up a couple weeks ago that I, I had not really thought about recently. It looks like the, right now, Clint Dempsey is the only American playing regularly in the Premier League as an outfield player. Is that, is that a concerning thing for us? So we've got all these German kids coming in. That's fantastic. Bundesliga is a very good league. But should there be any concern that, you know, okay, Eric Lehigh's hurt, and there's a couple other guys over there. I, I'm sorry, did we miss somebody at Norwich? Is um, Who's at Norwich? Zach Whitbread. Zach Whitbread. Is he playing regularly? See, I don't know. So this is the problem. It, it, Americans losing ground in England. He was at the start of the season, had some injury issues, hasn't been playing much lately. So you got Dempsey. I mean, is this, is this something we should be worried about? I mean, I, I don't know. Well, I mean, when you compare it even to – I remember when I went over to England in late 06 to do my Jay Demerit feature – when he was in the premiership with Watford and writing about the record number of U S players in the premier league that year. And I think it was eight or nine or 10. I mean, like it, and it wasn't just goalkeepers. Um, so yeah, it's definitely a concern. And, and yet would I rather have Josie Altador, you know, starting and playing for AZ in Holland or not playing much for whole city. Right. I'd rather have him in his current situation. So, I mean, you know, it, as long as guys are getting time elsewhere and you're seeing guys like Michael Bradley getting time at Kievo, you know, right. it, it makes his situation that he had at Aston Villa, you know, a little bit better in retrospect. All right. All right one more question before we get you out of here. Uh, you uh, campaigned for the FIFA presidency. It didn't happen. 
Got to ask you, if you were FIFA president, would you have let England go ahead and just have the poppies? Don't even worry about it. It's okay. We get it. Charity, all that stuff. You know what? I, I just don't understand the uproar on either side. I, I don't quite understand why FIFA threw a fit in the first place. And then I, I don't quite understand why David Cameron had to get involved uh, today. But <laughs> right. it looks like they reached a compromise. Um, it sounds like for... You know, for most of the last 80 some years, England hasn't really had to uh, or even tried to wear a poppy on their games in November. And so it makes you wonder why there's so much of an uproar. But uh, if this is the start of a daytime between England and FIFA, then I'm all for it. But my issue with it is that isn't it just about as um, unimportant? Well, not unimportant, <laughs> I want to say that, but just as. Um, a surface as taking your jersey off after as a goal celebration. It just seems like they do it to do it. Yeah, it doesn't hurt I mean, the honestly, game. to me, it's I I don't think there should have been as much of an uproar in England over the fact that the FIFA wasn't going to allow them to wear this poppy. I mean, and the fact that now FIFA has reached this compromise where they're going to be allowed to wear the armbands, um, it almost rewards. England for throwing this fit and, <laughs> right. you know, and not all of England, but only certain parts of England it right. became a big deal in the daily mail. Right. Well, um, of course, of course. <laughs> and so, you know, if they're able to have success doing it this way, then maybe they'll try other stuff in the future. Yep. I, you know, England's done a lot of good stuff in the last year though. I think it's important to note when it comes to challenging FIFA on things that really do matter to right. me. Uh, and that comes down to, to the the FIFA presidential vote. Do I, I I still wish that England had nominated somebody else to challenge Bladder, which they never did. Somebody, yeah, somebody. But yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, but <laughs> you know, at least they made a statement in a way that the U.S. Soccer Federation didn't. All right, Grant, fantastic stuff as always. We appreciate you taking out the time. Yeah, thanks for having me on, guys. Right. Hope we can do it again soon. Certainly. Have a good evening. All right, you guys. Too. Take care. Let's uh, let's take a break, everybody. It's the best soccer show, North American Soccer Network, NASN.TV, Jason and Jared, and we'll be right back. All right, all right, we'll be right back. Jason and Jared on the Best Soccer Show. Back for one more segment. Thanks again to Grant Wall. Grant's great. He'll take any question. Just roll with it. He's got something to say. So easy to talk to. Absolutely. Uh, all right, guys. We are here to take your phone calls. If you have them, 201-430-BEST, 201-430-2378. Also, Best Soccer Show on Skype. If you're on Skype, uh, just go ahead and hit the call thing, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to get you. Great feedback on voicemails this week. You guys are doing your part. I mean, I don't, we don't even know if we can get to all of them. There's so many. So yeah, please got... keep it up, and uh, if you don't get through this time, I, call I, live. I do have one piece of advice, and, and this especially, especially goes for our boy Pedro, who I like and has contributed a lot. MLS, uh, is he super Rid sub? Ridiculously good commentary. Yes. you got to keep your, your voicemails just a little shorter. Just a little, little shorter, okay? Because <laughs> I can't play. I can't play three minute clips on on the show. We just don't have enough time. But no so, matter how good they are, no matter how good they are. So Pedro's got one that's like two, three minutes. I can't play it, but it's good stuff. And uh, we'll just. Uh, I don't know. Did we, you want to? What, what, what was he talking about in it? Am I putting you on the spot? If you don't remember, I never got to hear it. You never played. Oh, it for I me. thought I played it for you. All right. Well, we do have a couple other ones. Let's uh, let's see from nine two area code nine two five. I'm not sure who this is. Let's try this one. Hi guys, loving the show so far. I would like to express a concern I have with uh, Landon Donovan and him missing the friendlies again. This is yet another chance he loses uh, a possible a chance to get a, <clears throat> that he loses to get assimilated into Clinsey's new system. Yes, I said Clinsey. And considering what he won't be that he won't be 100 percent if he actually does get into the February friendly, I don't think it's really fair that LD is still expected to start in qualifying, even though his, most likely his, his replacement might do well. I do know that LD has done a lot for us. And he can still contribute, contribute, but I don't think he's the same that you know, he's the same as last year. And I don't think anyone's above the team, so I think it's sad if we are still really depending on Donovan. I'm not asking to cut him off, but I'm asking if maybe he should be competing more for spots than to be really assumed 
a lock as many fans think he should be. Thanks. I love I love your opinion on this. Uh, bye. Uh, bye. Jared? I want to concentrate on one part of that where he <laughs> says that no player is above the team. Well, certainly. But you could. But here's the here's the problem is that there's two teams involved here. If on the right. Galaxy side, exactly. there's no player above that team. Correct. On the national team side, there's no player above that team. Correct. So it comes down to which team has more on the line. And I think you got to say the team that plays his wage every week that's in a cup final kind of needs to take priority over flying overseas for a friendly. I kinda, and I get it. I really do. And I understand I understand the caller's perspective as well. Landon Donovan is important to this team and maybe no one more so than the combination of he and Dempsey together, which we still have not seen. I get that everyone wants to see it. But I also get that the guy's got real money obligations I, right. I mean this is his job i kind of hate that we agree on this topic I, i'd like to fight you on this i'd like to yell at you that it landed on has to go to, to france and he has to go to slovenia what the hell is he doing this is the national team damn it but i don't think that's I, the do case. you think there's that much uproar over it i, I think, you so, think there's a no i think there I are think some, the majority is in that camp i think there are some people who are so focused on the national team and could care less about mls or la galaxy or anything like that that they do think that he should definitely go. And I've, I've had some discussions with people on Twitter, and nothing unreasonable, but mostly just, if here was the argument, Jared. He should not have accepted the call, the call-up from Klinsman in the first place, if he didn't think he was going to go if the Galaxy made the final, which I think is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard, because he, if he doesn't accept the call in the first place, not knowing if nothing the, better to do. Well, not no, yeah, not knowing if the Galaxy are going to the final, then he looks like a like a jerk for turning down the call when he's free after they lose to RSL, which they didn't. So he doesn't know what's going to happen. He has to accept the call now that they're in the final. I think that takes precedence. You you have a chance to win a championship versus going and playing a couple friendlies. Yes, it's important for Jurgen Klinsmann to get his best teams on the field so he can figure this whole thing out so we don't bomb out of qualification next year. But but really, really. What I'm interested to see, though, is this is the first time a player stand, kind of stood up to Klinsmann a bit. How's that going? How's Klinsmann going to handle it? I mean, I also, London Donovan's his boy. Let's not forget. I mean, this is a guy, he brought him to Bayern Munich, for God's sake. Right. So he's not going to punish him at all, well, right? I, I don't think so. You may, Grant Wall mentioned that, that he thought Klinsman sounded miffed about this. I, I don't understand how Klinsman... Okay, miffed just annoyed that he doesn't have his best players, but not necessarily angry directly at Donovan because I still do not understand how any, any player, especially Klinsman, who who played for Germany and, and was a, a, a great club player as well, how he couldn't understand what the choice Donovan if had If Jürgen Klinsman is coaching Bayern Munich this week in a cup final, he's going to want Schweinsteiger or Lahm at that game instead of playing against some a random company uh, country for Germany. Right. If their tables were reversed, he would want him at the club team. <laughs> but it, just the fact of the matter is he's at the national team level, so he wants what he wants. Right. No, I, I think that, that Klinsman, for him, his priorities take priority over everything else, and, and maybe, he is abs maybe he is annoyed at And he Donovan. has to be that way. He has right. to be. I'm sure, you know, his job is to win games for the national team, and he knows that Landon Donovan can help him do that. And and they you know they are a slightly lesser team without him, but that doesn't slightly. I, we're not really sure how much of a lesser team they are without him yet. Well, what I am like stoked on is that by Donovan missing, we're going to get a Johnson. chance to see what Fabian Johnson's right. all about. And I think that that's the silver lining for fans. Like you can, uh, in terms of watching the team when they play France on Friday, the the guy to watch for is, is Fabian Johnson. He gets his shot possibly because Donovan decided not to come along. But I, I, I the Donovan bashing has gotten so out of hand on so many levels that I can't, I, I just don't understand. Like, people go to irrational levels to, to come down on Landon Donovan. And, and I'm an admitted Donovan fan, but I would be saying this even if I wasn't. Even if I didn't particularly like the guy as a player or thought he was overrated or whatever, I would still be saying this. There is no legitimate and, and logical reason to criticize Landon Donovan for making the decision that he made. He's playing in a championship game a week after he was supposed to get back. I just don't. Uh, from a you know from a flight and okay if he breaks his leg in Paris if he if he hurts himself what happens then then everybody then you know the Galaxy fans are going to be miffed they're going to be distraught then we get the we finally get MLS dealing with that club versus country issue that everybody talks about. 
the flip side of what we just said though about the the silver lining being able to see different players like Fabian Johnson or someone like that. The flip side of that is though by Donovan not showing up and finally playing with Dempsey in this new system, we have to have even more patience, which is and patience is something that we have uh, we've been just banking on and uh, spending as US uh, national team fans for right. 4 months now. And we've been preaching it as well and I'm really trying to keep towing that line, but at some point I don't want to have to talk about patience anymore. Right. I right. want to have a real world system and and uh, example to say, hey, that's that's what our team looks like. We got a that's caller. That's what the team is supposed to look like. Nine seven. Ever your code nine seven two. Who's this? Hey, this is Will from Texas. How you guys doing? What's up, Will? What's going on? Yeah, yeah. yeah sorry to bother you guys, but uh, <laughs> the first time listening to your show and then uh, listening about how you guys were talking about Donovan and how he was uh, needed to go to uh, his club to uh, win a championship. I'd actually prefer all the older guys to not go into the national team. Let's see what the young talent we have, see well, what people can take them off their pedestal. Well, but yeah, but Will, I the, think we, uh, the thing about Donovan, okay. though, is, the thing about Donovan is he's still good enough to play for the national team. And if you're working on a system and you're a new coach and you're trying to, to flesh things out and you know that Landon Donovan is going to be a contributor, you want him there, whether fresh blood is a good thing or not. I mean, Fabian Johnson getting in, getting his shot if Donovan's out, that's a good thing. That's a silver lining, like well, I said. I want, but... I want Will to clarify this for me, Will. Are you saying that you just want the U.S. national team from now on just to go young gun all the time and just kind of start well, afresh anew for a new cycle? Or are you saying just for this trip in particular you wish you would take the young guns? Yeah, you see, this is what I'm saying. I'm saying probably for the earlier trips for the friendlies and maybe early qualifications. Uh Veteran experience is always helpful. So, I mean, it's definitely guidance for all the younger guys. You, so you definitely need that. But I'm just saying for, like, these friendlies, that newer newer talent needs to be shown. Right, but, but Will, right? you've got – In all possible, like, in all honesty, that U23 squad, I, I, I guarantee that squad is more talented than the national team. Oh, Ooh, wow. Just by that... looking at that roster. That's that's my opinion. Yeah, but that's by all... looking at their talent and their skill sets and uh... their athleticism. Yeah, you're telling me you've seen no, no. the uh, yeah, you've seen all those German kids. All right, play? Thanks for the call, Will. No, no, no. I'm, I hung up on Will because I have. This is where I'm going to go down this path again. This is us being entranced by potential again, right? This is what Will is doing. He is following down this path where we get all wrapped up in the potential. Look at all these guys they play in the Bundesliga. It's, it's like the Bachelor, Brecht, Jason Brexit, not Brexit, but like you know all of these these U23 guys. They're just so raw and talented, and they got uh, they've got all this this you know energy and they're really going to go after it and and now we've got Caleb Porter and he plays ex exciting soccer and we're uh, no th there's no way the U23 team no, no, is saying, better like, than the national like the team it's not it's possible it's like the first episode of the bachelor jason when all those hot chicks line up <laughs> and you're like oh my god look at all right. those hot chicks and then one by one they open their mouth and you're like oh god she doesn't know where texas is right you know, that kind of stuff you know they all come down to earth eventually they yes. can't all live up to the potential that we're making for exactly them. there are 37 names or 35 or whatever it is on that list and and a lot of them will be professional soccer players but not all of them are going to contribute to the national team and not all of them not all of the ones you think you're you're tabbing as stars right now not, not all of those guys are going to be stars there's going to be and not some all failures. of them are, not all of them are going to choose to play for the usa eventually too that's, I bet. that's a possibility as well all right uh we got uh a couple other topics here i definitely want to hit before we get out uh the u.s open cup might be uh changing format or structure however you want to say this all 16 well sorry all mls teams i guess it would be 16 because you've got three Canadian teams next year. So all 16 U.S. teams would be in the tournament to start the tournament rather than this weird play-in thing that MLS tends to do to get a couple teams into U.S. Open Cup. What do you make of this? I kind I like it because it just seems more pure of a system where you earn it from day one, and no one's guaranteed anything, nothing special for any team. You earn it all, all the way, and it just seems to me that's the way it should be. And the, the flip side of that would be like you have to play more games potentially, right. and it adds more congestion to an already congested calendar. Right. But if you're to believe the rumors out there for how the next uh, year will be scheduling wise, there should be less travel for these teams if they start going more to the conference based system and playing an unbalanced schedule. So what you hopefully will gain in the convenience of less travel for these teams, maybe you can make up for in the congestion. I, I don't I don't know. I, I'd have to be convinced on this. I like the I, I like the US Open Cup. I think it should be a bigger deal, but it's just not. And as as it exists right now, throwing everybody into the mix, I, I don't know. I, I just think that you know, it's it's just more stuff for people not to be interested. It makes in. for more drama. It makes sure, for but, more like David and Goliath but story. Nobody lines. cares right now. The only people that care live in Seattle, and good for them. I'm a, I'm happy that they that they care, and they've gone and won it twice in a row. But I, I just don't see everybody else 
putting in the effort. So all you're going to have is I want to say, see David Beckham play against a guy that cleans pools for a living on the side <laughs> and plays on a semi pro team. That would be I awesome. mean, that's what I, we kind of did see that I think yeah. in some games, even in MLS, but I, I want to see those matchups. I want to see a, a guy that plays in, in, in a pub league that made it through the first round of the qualifying, get a chance to play against a professional player. I, I'm interested in seeing that, but I, I also see the point of, I don't want to see it at the expense of, the actual league and the and the fatigue of these players, and right. I hope that the MLS teams are able to put out real rosters uh, for, for that's a lot of these always games. The question. But you're not going to see it at first. No, no, of course not. Uh, a couple other quick hitters. The Revolution shook up their front office. I don't know what this means. I have. I, I mean, I'm a little kind of just like it looks like cosmetic stuff to me. Brian Belillo moves from one job to another. Sneo Galati is no longer. Uh, no like. longer in an, the like. president. He's moved to a consultant position, which I'm assuming means less involvement. And I, I don't know. I mean, this is one of the, that's one of those things that people always complain about the conspiracy theorist, so you know, Galati being on the payroll of the revolution. If this maybe this makes them feel better, I don't really think it matters too much until they get that stadium, and they're they're maintaining that that's their priority. But until they get their stadium, it's just going to be all, more of the same for New England. Is this a slap in the face to to uh, Sunil? No, I don't. I don't think so. I, I'm guessing he was involved in the discussions to to change, and I don't know why. Well, basically, he... they just kind of said, "Okay, step aside, Sunil. We're, we're going to take control of this. We don't like the way this is going." Well, I mean, like that's I what said, I get from it. You don't know that he wasn't involved in the conversations. That they said we have to make some changes. We're going to shake things up. We want this guy here and this guy here. We're making uh, Burns so you, general you're manager. You're the president of 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 an MLS soccer team. You're also, I think, he's still teaching. He's got his teaching job, well, right? Maybe, that's what I'm he's saying. Maybe president he just... of USSF. How many balls can this guy juggle in the <laughs> air and still keep New well, England a priority? Okay. It doesn't look like this team is a priority. Then, then all the all the better that that they moved him around. I, I just I just think, like I said, I think this is mostly cosmetic. And the other big news that we've had to deal with, not to, not that anybody really cares that much outside of Colorado, a championship winning coach from last year, Gary Smith, is out already. Uh, you knew, you kind of knew it was coming. They've had a lot of beef over there uh, at Dick's Sporting Good Parks between... Uh, How unrealistic were the expectations for Gary Smith this year? Is that what you think this comes down to? I, I think he burned some bridges. I think he just kind of... Uh, you know, I'm talk sure he burned some bridges, door. but I mean, uh, it, publicly they're not going to say that. They're saying he if he failed to... Attain certain, uh, attain certain yeah, goals. That team I'm was sure a, MLS Cup was again on there, and it was unrelistic from the beginning to the make MLS very Cup good. again for Colorado. The team wasn't very good. They weren't that good last year when they won it all. They weren't that good this year. They just weren't that good. And uh, you know, I, I I liked Gary Smith from a personality standpoint. I mean, they played some pretty ugly, pretty drab, pretty boring soccer most of the time. He had Elmore Cummings scoring a couple goals. Oh, whoop de do. Let's go get win an MLS Cup. Yeah, I, I don't Listen, know. If Connor Casey that, that is out for a good portion of the season and Omar Cummings is out for a good portion of the season, nothing right was going to go right. Well, like I go said, for that team. He did, you know, he didn't go down to to I think it was Mexico, maybe it was Central America for Central America for a uh, a Concacaf Champions League game. Sent, sent an assistant, didn't go himself. Sent a, a second rate team. They ended up. I think they ended up winning the game. But uh, it's definitely Central America. They ended up winning the game, and I mean, this is the kind of respect he had. Sounds for like Hans Baca, right? There, I mean, I don't think that you could definitely say he wasn't fired for cause. But at the same Gary time, Gary Smith and Steve Nickel are out of a job, and Hans Baca still has <laughs> one. Think about that yeah. for a second. That, that's what that's what we'll leave you with. Think about that for a second. Everybody goes to iTunes and please rate. Are and you review even us. watching? Yes. Are you even watching? Uh, we are available in. Uh, a couple of different places. Go to nasn.tv to find out where those places are. Uh, you can send us email at best soccer show at nasn.tv. Uh, Mr. Rodius, what else am I forgetting? Uh, we have a, a nice little interview that Mr. Jason Davis did with Caleb Porter last night that is available on iTunes and on NASN.TV. Go check that out if you want to hear more about the under-23 Olympic team and the reigning national college champions, Akron. Their yep. coach, Caleb Porter, was on with us last night. Yeah, go look for that a special episode. All right, that's going to do it for a Wednesday. Thank you guys for listening. We'll talk to you on Sunday. Bye.